so much. Thank you for your kind words. It's always a pleasure to be back at SciCon, see many familiar faces in the audience. Uh, one thing that we don't hear too much this year, or maybe I just haven't been paying attention, is a reminder of the theme of the conference. And so the, th the theme of the conference is maximizing effects. But I will put it to you that not all effects deserve to be maximized. And so if some cyber operations, because we will be talking a lot about cyber operations, if some cyber operations have detrimental impact on the rights of other states, then perhaps there is a duty of states to mitigate, to stop such cyber operations, or even to prevent them. And so this principle, or this putative duty, is sometimes referred to as the principle of due diligence. Now, how far does this duty go? How far should it perhaps evolve further? And what are the gray zones in this area is what we are going to explore in this panel. Now, I hope you will agree with me that we couldn't have a more qualified and a more interesting panel than we have today. Because all of the bios of all of the speakers are online and because we don't have too much time, I'm not going to do long introductions, but I will just tell you very, very briefly who are our speakers today. So the one who is staring the most intently at me at the moment <laughs> is Professor... I'm trying to figure out if you're the Kubo guy from the animated cartoon. Are you that Kubo? I'm going to show you my two strings later, Mike. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. So uh, Professor Mike Schmidt is also very well known uh, to this crowd. Uh, he's also my colleague at the University of Exeter, I'm very pleased to say. And his other affiliations include the US Naval, Naval War College and of course the center here. Now, Mike will be speaking to us today about the Tallinn Manual and, its, and the position that the International Group of Experts took on the principle of due diligence, where many of you will know two rules, rule six and seven, were dedicated to this principle. Then the second on the panel will be Mr. Peter Stockberger, uh, who is a senior managing associate at Dentons. And now uh, Peter will also be known to SciCon. Uh, last year he presented a very good paper <coughs> about how the law of attribution could evolve. And today he's also going to talk about this Lex Ferenda uh, aspect. So he's going to explore whether the principle of due diligence in international cyber law should also evolve further than it perhaps is at the moment. And then uh, on my very, very left is Professor Karine Banelier from uh, Université Grenoble Alpes, uh, who has also very many uh, publications in the area of international cyber law. And one of them that I would like to highlight today in particular has a very interesting subtitle, and it's called who is afraid of cyber diligence? And so I can see many faces around here, so I hope none of us are afraid of the topic that we're going to face today. We have not that much time left, so we agreed with uh, the organizers that I'm going to, I can, I I'm allowed to be myself today, so I'm going to be a very rude moderator, and I'm going to enforce the time limit very strictly. So all of our speakers have exactly 15 minutes to present their papers. And then we will have some time, we have all together 75 minutes, so not too much, we'll have some time for Q&A. So with that, enough from me, and Mike, you have the floor. Thanks, Kubo. I'm just nervous because the clock hasn't started. Is this because I work with you? Uh, good afternoon, I think I know probably 50 or 60% of the audience, so it's good to see everyone again. What we're going to be talking about today, or what I'm going to be talking about today, is the approach that was taken by the international group of experts during the seven-year Tallinn Manual project to the principle of due diligence. Now, there has been at this conference an awful lot of talk about the issue of sovereignty, a sovereignty of rule of international law or merely a principle of international law. Whatever the correct answer to that question, whatever that answer may be, Nonetheless, if it is an obligation, I'm sorry, if it is a, a right, then it has corresponding obligations. Because in international law, when states have rights, other states have obligations to respect those particular rights. So due diligence is one of those rules of international law that come from the principle of sovereignty. So we're gonna move the discussion from sovereignty now to due diligence. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the paper by uh, Paul, Paul? Peter. Peter. The paper by Peter, I don't remember his name, but I remember the paper. It's excellent. I encourage you to read it. Lays out the history of the principle of due diligence, and I commend that piece to you to look at the history of due diligence. But if we start in relatively modern times, we start with the first case before the International Court of Justice, which was, of course, Corfu Channel. 
And Corfu Channel was, in fact, a due diligence case, a case that involved the requirement of due diligence with respect to Albanian control over territorial waters. Had to do with British warships. The facts aren't horribly important. But what you need to know is that the very first case before the International Court of Justice dealt with this particular principle. And it, it, it was based on an arbitration, Island of Palmas, based on statements set forth in an arbitration between the United States and the Netherlands in which the arbitral panel, the famous Max Huber, told us that the principle of sovereignty, remember the basis of due diligence, or basis of due diligence, requires a state to protect within its territory the rights of other states. So we concluded in the Tal Emanuel group that the principle of due diligence meant that if you were in control of territory, then you must ensure that territory is not used to the detriment of other states. Now that's a very broad statement and what I'd like to do is spend the rest of our time here together teasing that loose. The first question is where does the principle of due diligence attach? Clearly from Island of Palmas, it attaches within the territory. So with respect to all activities, all activities in the, in the territory, and with respect to all cyber infrastructure in the territory, because a state enjoys sovereignty over things in its territory, the due diligence principle attaches. We did struggle a wee bit with the question of, does the due diligence obligation of a state attach outside the territory of that state? We said it did so in two different cases. The first case here is when you have cyber infrastructure that's under the governmental control of that state outside its country. So I'm an American, I work for the Department of Defense. We have facilities outside our country that involve cyber infrastructure and to the extent that's under our control or under joint control by the way, then we have an obligation to ensure that cyber infrastructure is not used to the detriment of other states. The second example of the, of the obligation of chatching outside of territory is when a state controls that territory. In other words, it's not their state, but they're in control. And the classic case would be if a state is in belligerent occupation of territory, has the United States, has the United Kingdom was with respect to Iraq. Even though it wasn't our territory, we had an obligation to ensure that bad things did not emanate from that territory. Why? Because as a matter of law, we were in control of that territory. That was pretty easy. It got very hard for us when we hit the next question. Okay, now we know where the due diligence obligation attaches, but when does it attach? What are the conditions precedent to the attachment of the due diligence obligation? We said there were two. The first is that the obligation only has to do with cyber operations from or through your territory that affect the rights, the rights of other states. In other words, a right of another state under international law. For example, the right to be free from intervention by another state the right uh, to be free from the use of force from another state, and if sovereignty is a rule, the right to be free from violations of your sovereignty by virtue of cyber operations conducted from another state. So we'll focus on rights, then we'll move to the next question, the next criterion, which is those consequences must be serious and adverse. So the, the operation from your territory or going through your territory or through cyber infrastructure must affect the rights of the state, the, the target state, and in addition, the consequences there must be serious and adverse. With respect to the rights of other states, we drew that directly from Corfu Channel. That's what Corfu Channel said, here we go. I wanted to give you an example though because this is often misunderstood. We're not talking about the interests of other states. We're not talking about merely doing something other states don't like. We're talking about an operation from your territory or from cyber infrastructure in your territory that affects a right that state enjoys under international law. So let me give you an example. The first one is, is clear, there is a right involved. State A is launching destructive malware against State B's pipeline. 
there's an explosion, okay? Malray reports back to state C, and state C knows about it. You'll see in a moment, knowledge is important. This is crystal clear. This is a violation of the right of sovereignty, for example. It may be a violation of the right to be free from the use of force on your territory, for example. In certain cases, it may be a violation of the prohibition on intervention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a legal right that has been affected. Contrast that with this one. This is a case where a state has classified documents of another state. A has the classified documents of B. They make those documents available in state C. So the question here is, does state C have a due diligence obligation to put an end to the publication of those documents? Answer in this case, no. Even if the consequences are serious and adverse. Nevertheless, you can't identify a legal right under international law that the aggrieved state had. You don't have a right to keep your secrets secret, okay? Second criterion, serious adverse consequences. We drew this from the very famous arbitration trail smelter, which used the term. It is a term drawn from environmental law. Environmental law has a lot of due diligence obligations with respect to transborder harm. So we drew it from here, but we drew it by analogy because we could not identify a precise point where the consequences are so severe in the target state that you have to act. The state that, that it has the due diligence obligation has to act. So we borrowed this from environmental law. We did say that the consequences may not only need not only be on government infrastructure, but it could be on private infrastructure. So if, you have, if you're the target state and your commercial companies, your private entities are suffering harm, and that implicates a right under international law, then due diligence has been implicated. We use the example here, infrastructure of a financial system, that's bad. Uh, defacing part of the Ministry of Sports website that is providing information on their football team and the European Cup. That's not so bad, although the Europeans tell me that actually may be worse than the financial thing, but whatever. This is a very interesting case that we could not come to agreement on. It's a botnet. And we asked the question, if we're looking for serious adverse consequences, which perspective are we looking at the serious adverse consequences from? From the state, where, the territorial state where there are the bots, or are we looking at the target state? So you see a botnet may have serious adverse consequences affecting the right in the target state, but because the bots are spread out in various countries, then in particular countries, you may not have those bots themselves causing enough damage. Here, the group of experts was split. We don't know the answer to this question. The, minor, the majority of the group said you may not aggregate consequences. But this was the minority. Both views were entirely reasonable. Must have knowledge. There must be knowledge that what is occurring is having serious adverse consequences vis-a-vis -vis the rights of other states. You gotta know it's happening. And we extended that to constructive knowledge. So your intelligence agency tells you actual knowledge. Another intelligence agency from the target state that says, yo, what's happening here? This is happening from your country. Do something that's actual knowledge. And then constructive knowledge, there are situations where states should know widespread viruses and stuff. We use the example of heart bleed, but there are many examples where states should know. If a reasonable state in same or similar circumstances would have known, then there is constructive knowledge and we believe that that knowledge requirement was satisfied. What does the territorial state have to do? Has to make it stop. Has to make it stop. We went, so, so our due diligence obligation applies to ongoing operations. We did talk about a situation in which the attack or the operation the harmful operation is imminent. Material steps have been taken and it's about to be launched and in that case we said the due diligence operation had uh, due diligence obligation attached because the operation is really unfolding now. So maybe the re results haven't materialized but hey, this thing has started and in that case, the, t the state where the operation is being launched from has an obligation to take measures.
And with regard to preventive measures, my friends up here are going to talk, I believe, about preventive measures. We came to the conclusion that in the current state of the law, the lex lata does not yet reach preventive measures. In, so in other words, ensuring the hygiene of your cyber infrastructure and so forth at this time. We don't know what it's going to look like in the future, but today we could not find sufficient state practice or opinion juris in other than environmental law to suggest that this was the case. And then there's the question, let's assume you got serious adverse consequences affecting the right of another state with respect to cyber operations from bad guys, other states or non-state actors being launched from your territory, and you know about it? What do you got to do? We believe that the standard is feasibility. You have to do everything that's reasonable in the circumstances. And every state represented in this room is in slightly different situation. Some have a lot of technical wherewithal. Some are financially uh, wealthy, OK? Some have great institutional capacity to deal with cyber incidents. What you do is you look at the state. You take the state as you found it. And then you ask, would a state in these circumstances be able to take action to put an end to the operation. And oh, by the way, the fact that you can't act under your domestic law, we apply here a doctrine from the University of Texas where I got my law degree. It's called the Tough Noogie Doctrine. All right? You, don't have, any, you have a law that says you can't arrest that person. That's your problem. That's not the problem of the state suffering. You're in breach of your legal obligation to me. When we, uh, as I'll say, and I'm going to conclude in just uh, one minute and 43 seconds, um, when we went to states, there was some hesitancy on the part of some states with regard to this particular principle, this particular rule. One of the things I told them is you need to understand what this gives you. One of the things you're worried about are the actions of non-state actors. As many of you know, below the threshold of, uh, of an armed attack, to which you can respond in self-defense below the threshold, the actions you take are either retorsion, which are unfriendly but lawful actions, or alternatively countermeasures. And what we said, you can't take countermeasures against non-state actors unless their actions are attributable to states. That's the law, okay? Most states believe that's the law. So there's a problem. There's another state, non-state actors are whacking you. Can you shoot back? Well, you can't do countermeasures against them on the basis of their actions alone because they're non-state actors. But what you can do is ask the question, is that state in breach of its due diligence obligation? If the answer is yes, the obligation is owed to you. So now you're the victim of an internationally wrongful act on the part of the territorial state, and you may respond with a countermeasure against the state failing the due diligence obligation. And what does that take the form of? takes the form of an operation against the non-state actors. So due diligence for those representing states gives you an opportunity for a, a more robust response against the actions of non-state actors when those actions are not severe enough to reach the level allowing you to engage in self-defense. I want to be a little bit careful. Can I have extra 30 seconds? I want to be a little bit careful here. Because in, I come from the kinetic world, uh, a war college, there is the unwilling, unable test in self-defense. Here, this is not the unwilling, unable test. It is, the un, it is the unwilling test. If a state is unable, then it is not feasible and it is not in breach of its obligation and it doesn't open up these doors. So my last slide. Very Mike, quickly, the sorry, UNGG. Mike, we, will, we will have to cut the time yeah. because we said I, 15 minutes, so I have to impose. Let my me finish the last slide because it's, it's important for the audience. Thank you, Kubo, for your input. Um, <laughs> the UNGGE has addressed this issue twice. Some of you know. Some of you are part of the UNGG. You should know the UNGG has not said this is law. This is a hortatory norm. They have used the word should. We concluded that that did not mean there wasn't a norm. It means they could not achieve agreement in the UNGG if it achieved this status. Kubo, thank you so much for the extra 45 yes, seconds. thank you, Mike. And thank you for your attention. So it's always nice to see when there are rules with limited enforcement capability. <laughs> <laughs> this is international law. What are you talking so, about? 
Yes, <laughs> but perhaps there is an obligation of due diligence. But I think we should all thank Mike for his excellent speech. Thanks, Peter. And before we move on uh, to Peter, I would just highlight one of the things that Mike mentioned, and that's uh, the criterion of serious adverse consequences. And I'm really glad that you highlighted that it's something that comes from international right. environmental law, sure. because Peter is going to focus, I think it's an excellent bridge between the two presentations. Peter is going to talk about precautionary principle and to what extent that can, as another concept from international environmental law, develop the law in this area. Peter. Great. Thanks, Kubo. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Mike, for the great uh, start. I disagree with everything you said, obviously. That's okay, Paul, Peter, whatever. Paul, Peter. Uh, so as the title of my paper indicates, I'm going to be focusing on what Mike talked about, which is the preventative aspect of due diligence, and specifically what's called the precautionary principle. And my, my proposal in the paper, my theory, is that states, if they adopt the precautionary principle as it's reflected in international environmental law, it will give more teeth to the due diligence principle under customary international law as it applies in cyberspace. So my, my talk today is going to focus on three points. I'm going to look at due diligence and the precautionary approach as it currently exists under international law. I'm going to look at how the precautionary approach was dealt with by the authors of the Talon Manual. And then I'm going to talk about my proposal, which is a procedural due diligence requirement to conduct what I'm proposing to be a cyber impact assessment by states, which would then give more teeth to the due diligence principle in cyberspace. So just to, to go over the due diligence principle once more, uh, not to repeat too much what Mike said, it is rooted in the principle of sovereignty. That definition of sovereignty, which is every state's right to exercise its rights as a state to the exclusion of other states. And it comes from the Island of Palmas decision in that particular language. And it's also rooted in uh, adjoining principles to the principle of sovereignty, obligations and restrictions, one of those being the principle of non-intervention. And the principle of non-intervention is most famously articulated in Ch Article 2 um, of the UN Charter, uh, 2.4 and 2.7. And so out an outgrowth of the principle of non-intervention is the due diligence principle, which restricts states from taking, uh, from allowing their territory or the organs under their control or items under their jurisdictional control to harm other states, to inflict internationally wrongful acts. So I want to look at how the due diligence principle and the precautionary principle have been uh, articulated in international law by looking at four International Court of Justice cases. This is the International Court of Justice. For those who don't know, it is the principal judicial <coughs> organ of the United Nations. It is charged under the UN Charter and the statute of the court to entertain two types of cases. Contentious cases between two states, and it can also issue advisory opinions when one of the organs of the United Nations asks for an advisory opinion, like the Security Council or the General Assembly. So the first uh, ICJ case that talked about due diligence is, is what Mike talked about, the 1949 Corfu Channel case between the United Kingdom and Albania. And in that case, the court held that Albania did have an obligation to warn the United Kingdom about mines that were in the Corfu Channel. And so this was the first time, and it was the court's first opportunity to issue a decision, that the court endorsed the due diligence principle. Um, and it comes here, you can see it says a well-recognized principle, every state's obligation to not knowingly allow its territory. So that's the first time the court articulates the due diligence principle. The next opportunity the court has is in its 1996 advisory opinion on the use and the legality of nuclear weapons. And so this goes back to what I was talking about before. The ICJ has jurisdiction to issue advisory opinions on questions posed to it. And in this case, the General Assembly asked the, the Court of Justice to opine on whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons is permitted under international law. And the court famously said, no. It's, or it famously said, customary international law has not developed on that point, uh, so we cannot rule on that, on that point. But it did reaffirm the due diligence principle and it specifically said that the due diligence principle is part of the body of law that applies to international environmental law. And that's important because after the 1996 opinion, when we fast forward to 2010, the court then addresses the due diligence principle and specifically the precautionary principle that I'm advocating for in cyberspace in the 2010 case concerning uh, the pulp mills between Argentina and Ur Ur Uruguay. And in the Pulp Mills decision, 
Argentina was contending that Uruguay violated the due diligence principle when it was constructing pulp mills on the river Uruguay, and that it did not warn Argentina about the transboundary effect of that pulp mill. And the court affirmed the due diligence principle generally, said it is a reflection of customary international law, which is important when the court of justice uh, makes these statements. Because the International Court of Justice, under Article 38 of its statute, is charged with determining the current existence of international law as it exists at the time when it renders the decision on the dispute. And so when the Court of Justice says a certain principle is reflective of customary international law, or when they uh, render an opinion as to the interpretation of a treaty, it, it carries significant weight in terms of the actual status of customary international law. And so the court identified in this decision that the principle of prevention is reflective of customary international law as part of the due diligence principle. And so that's important because that is in a reflection by the court that it is uh, part of custom. Now, the, this decision was related to an international environmental law case. And so arguably it's only limited to international environmental law. But the court did say that it's part of the corpus of international law and it endorsed the procedural aspect of the precautionary principle by saying states should conduct environmental impact assessments when there is a likelihood that transboundary harm would occur from their activities. When you fast forward to 2015, the court again endorses this concept. And this was the 2015 case involving the construction of a road in Costa Rica between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. And in this case, the court again affirmed the due diligence principle. It affirmed that environmental impact assessments are a procedural aspect of the due diligence principle in international environmental law. And it also clarified what an environmental impact assessment would look like in this context. And they specifically said, the court said, that the content and the subject matter and the scope of an environmental impact assessment, an EIA, would be left to the states. It's up to the domestic law of the states to determine what that would look like. It simply affirmed that it is a procedural requirement to conduct the assessment in the first instance. And if you fail to conduct that assessment, then you are violating your due diligence obligations under customary international law. And so this procedural aspect is really the, the main takeaway from the Costa Rica case. Now, the precautionary principle is not just reflected in these four International Court of Justice cases. Between 1971 and 1991, it, it was well reflected in a number of environmental documents. It really picked up steam in 1992 to the present uh, with the Rio Declaration, uh, with a variety of environmental documents. The International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has endorsed the due diligence principle and the precautionary approach. The World Trade Organization has also adopted the precautionary principle. It's reflected in the ICJ, Pulp Mills, and the Costa Rica decisions. And most recently, you can find it in the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, which in my practice, we advise uh, corporate clients on compliance with this law. And under the GDPR, if you engage in a data project or a, some sort of conduct that may impact the data subject rights under the GDPR, you must conduct a data impact assessment, and you must document it, and you must provide the results of that assessment to the individual whose rights may be impacted. So we see this idea of a procedural impact assessment being a procedural requirement in a number of areas of law. So how is due diligence and the precautionary approach addressed in cyberspace? Well, in my paper, I look at the various aspects in Talon Manual 1, 2.0, and the GGE reports. And I'll go through this quickly because Mike already focused on what the Talon Manual said. In Talon Manual 1, uh, the due diligence principle was reaffirmed, but the international group of experts could not achieve consensus on the scope and the application of that obligation. When we move to Talon 2.0, the group of experts took a more pointed opinion on the prevention principle, which, which Mike spoke about. And that is that the obligation of prevention does not apply or it is not the lex lata. And I'm in agreement with that. It's not. There's not sufficient state practice for that. But the reasons why or the cautionary points in the commentary in Talon 2.0 about why prevention can't apply in cyberspace, I think would be addressed by a procedural due diligence obligation to conduct a cyber impact assessment, perhaps not equivalent to, but similar to an environmental impact assessment. 
And, and as Mike indicated um, in the 2013 and 15 reports of the GGE, they endorsed the due diligence principle, but they used the word, um, they, they, that's a typo there. They used, it, it was more oratory than mandatory. And so it raised the question generally, is the principle of due diligence actually reflective of customary international law? Because states did not endorse it as a mandatory obligation, but they didn't address the principle of prevention or the precautionary principle. So it leads me to what is my proposal? My proposal is, is that if states, as the Lex Veranda adopted a cyber impact assessment requirement as a procedural due diligence requirement that doesn't necessarily require them to act in any particular instance, but it requires them to conduct an annual cyber impact assessment on their national cyber infrastructure, and if after conducting that assessment, they determine that the cyber infrastructure is either being used by third parties or the way it's conducting its cyber activities may impact the rights of another state, then the substantive due diligence obligation to notify the potentially harmed state and potentially take uh, remedial actions would be triggered. So it's a procedural obligation that would only trigger a substantive obligation if certain findings are made. And so the features of this cyber impact assessment is I, I think it should be conducted annually. And one of the things I struggled with in sort of developing this idea was um, how often do you have to conduct it? In the environmental context, an environmental impact assessment is only conducted once the state undertakes an industrial activity or some type of activity that may cause harm to the other state. So that doesn't really apply in the cyber context. You can't really say a state can only uh, conduct a cyber impact assessment when they undertake a cyber project that may impact another state, because the cyber infrastructure is always uh, developing, is always evolving. So I think an annual assessment as a baseline requirement and a, continually mo a continual monitoring requirement, if certain findings are made, would be part of this obligation. I think an existing, existing cybersecurity frameworks could serve as the model for the cyber impact assessment. The, the current cybersecurity frameworks that we have that we operate within the United States, the NIST framework, um, you have the ISO standards, you have standards issued by HIPAA. There are, for example, the High Trust uh, Health Trust Alliance develops a common security framework. There are robust cybersecurity frameworks that could be used by states to conduct the cyber impact assessment. The Department of Homeland Security has a very robust critical infrastructure assessment tool that's available to industry that they also use for the, for the national infrastructure. And so states are actually already engaging in these types of assessments. So it wouldn't be too, uh, too far afield to impose this on them or for them to impose it on themselves. And again, action, this is, the critical point is that it's a procedural due diligence requirement. It's separating it out. And so action and notice, notice to the potentially impacted state or action to prevent the, what, what is found in the assessment would only be triggered if the state determines that there's a reasonable likelihood of harm to the other state. And a, a question would be, well, how do you keep states in check? How do you know that they're actually going to follow their substantive due diligence obligations when they're conducting the assessment themselves? Well, that's where state responsibility comes into play. That's where a case before the International Court of Justice could potentially flesh that out. Because under the Pulp Mills decision and under the Costa Rica decision, the court made clear that the state asserting an, an action under the, uh, at the International Court of Justice bears the burden of proving that claim by fully conclusive evidence. And the state who's the defendant or the respondent in the case has an obligation to provide evidence to assist in the fact finding of the court. So in that case, in that scenario, the applicant would allege that the respondent did not follow their procedural due diligence obligations and would demand the production of their cyber impact assessment, perhaps under the review of the court, confidential review of the court. And from there, they could prove their case. So this, again, this is a procedural requirement. Importantly, the court said in, in the Costa Rica judgment, in the 2015 judgment, that the materiality of the assessment, what the assessment is conducted of, the environmental assessment, is left up to the states the domestic law. And I think it could also be left up to bilateral, multilateral treaties. Again, though, still reflecting that the procedural due diligence is, is reflective of custom. <coughs> I think procedural due diligence would provide clarity 
in cyberspace for the application of due diligence with all the questions raised by Mike's presentation. I think that could be an area of a starting point for states. And I do think that it's scalable and manageable because the cyber impact assessment that the United States would conduct would not be the same cyber impact assessment that Nicaragua would conduct. Yet, they would be obligated based on their national capability to conduct these assessments and to provide notice and take action uh, where adequate. And I think if that were adopted by states, as the Lex Veranda, not, it's not the Lex Lata, if that were adopted, I think it would provide greater teeth to due diligence in cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, again, I would just, uh, as perhaps a bridge between uh, uh, Peter's talk and Karin's talk that will immediately follow, uh, when Peter talks about this, the, the scope of the obligation to prevent, one way of looking at it is that obligation to prevent, although tempered by all the procedural considerations, implies an obligation of result. Now, Karin, on the other hand, is going to look at obligations of conduct and the variable or the variability factors that the due diligence principle entails. Karin, over to you. Thank you, Kubo. Um, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be there today in order to present you this question of uh, flexibility and obligation of conduct in the due diligence principle. Um, this is in French, I will translate it in English. <laughs> he who can and does not prevent sins. This famous legal saying of the 17th century reflects well what the principle of due diligence expresses in the 21st century towards sovereign states in the cyberspace to intervene when they know and they may in order to prevent acts injurious to the right of other states. Fertile principle of international law, due diligence is called today to play a central role in the regulation of digital activities, especially in the prevention and reaction to cyber attacks. However, a few states and also some scholars have questioned the very existence of obligation of due diligence in the cyberspace. These objections seem to be due to a misunderstanding of the very nature of due diligence, which is by definition an obligation of conduct and not of result, and which <coughs> implies variability factors. It is true that the concept of due diligence is a complex one, but uh, the answer to this complexity can certainly not be to delete due diligence from state's obligation, but to better explain the nature, functions, and parameter of this principle. So my presentation will be twofold. I will first briefly address the objection concerning the very existence of due diligence in international law and in the cyberspace. I will then concentrate on the challenges of the application of due diligence from both from the point of view of the behavior required by state and from the point of view of their international responsibility. Many objections against the application of due diligence in the cyberspace turn around the very <coughs> existence of obligation of diligence in general international law or their existence in the specific field of cybersecurity. For some, due diligence is only a soft law standard. For others, there is no general rule relating to due diligence that would be applicable in all fields of international law. Thus, if one wishes to put forward the existence of an obligation of due diligence in the cyberspace, it is necessary to provide proof of a primary rule, like a treaty imposing such obligations in the cyberspace. But this does not exist for the time being, and according to this objection, there is no state practice in this field. However, I do not agree with these objections because if we have a look to the international jurisprudence and practice of states in the 19th century, it is very hard, if not impossible, to find one field in international law where due diligence has not been incorporated. 
Moreover, it is uncontested that the obligation of due diligence applies in the specific field of the protection of the security of states because due diligence is founded on one of the most important obligations of international law, as was recalled by uh, Peter and Mike, which is every state's obligation not to allow knowingly its territory to be used for acts contrary to the rights of other states. There is thus today ample evidence that due diligence is a general principle of international law, which flows from state sovereignty and that applies in all cases, all field and all activities. Due diligence then refers directly to the responsibility of states for transboundary harmful acts, whether public or private, and irrespective of the precise nature of the acts in question, whether physical or cyber. As rightly said, the Tallinn Manual, due diligence is part of the Lex Lata, and as a general principle of international law, due diligence applies also in the cyberspace. Moreover, as you can see, some states, there is now a practice of states. Some states have also recognized the application of the due diligence in the cyberspace. For example, France, in its very recent strategic review of cyber defense published this year, has expressly recognized the application of due diligence in the cyberspace, and it has also recognized the associated concept of cyber diligence used to describe in one word, due diligence obligation in the cyberspace, a concept I used uh, already and explained in 2014 in a conference in Tartu mm. under the supervision of Mike Schmidt and in an article published in the Baltic Yearbook. Other objections against due diligence in the cyberspace are focused on its application and on what scholars call the normative indeterminacy of the legal regime of due diligence. According to them, due diligence could only be applied in the cyberspace on condition that it be specified and clarified. They also denounce the dangers of the application of the principle, arguing that the responsibility of state could be engaged every time they are not able to prevent the occurrence of an arm to another state due to a cyber operation launched from their territory or transiting through their territory or infrastructure. It is true that concepts such as due diligence seem to pertain to what Hart had described as the open texture of legal language. But it is also true that all legal orders have norms that are imprecise, vague, and with a texture that remains very open. These norms, which variable content, are willingly introduced by the legislator when he wants to take into account the fact that he is not capable of predicting everything and setting everything with precision in advance. So an attempt to define, determine, specify every norm before applying it in a specific context would destroy the inherent flexibility and adaptability that make the strengths of these norms. It devotes them to the organ of application of the law, starting with judicial courts, to detail its content on a case per case basis. And if we look back to the past, it can be observed that international courts that have applied the due diligence principles for the very first time in entirely new field of international law, such as neutrality in 1872 or in the environment in 1941, were not stopped by the normative indeterminacy of the obligation of due diligence. This jurisprudence and also the work of the UN uh, International Law Commission show that due diligence is not appraised in an abstract manner. Various parameters or variability factors are used when assessing the obligation of due diligence. It seems that we have uh, in this field four main variability factors, knowledge, capacity, risk, 
and harm. So I don't have the time to de de detail here each of them, so just a glimpse, and um, a pub I have published an article on this question of who is afraid of cyber diligence, which detailed us these uh, variability factors. So what is important is to see that in the cyberspace, knowledge can raise some legitimate concerns. However, it must be recalled that as the ICG said, the obligation of due diligence does not imply that state knows everything that happens on their territory or under their control. The degree of care expected is that of a good government. Capacity, states do not have the same capacity in the cyberspace. As a consequence, some states could feel that the obligation of due, due, due diligence could expose them too easily to the reaction of third states. However, this concern must not be overestimated because capacity is a variability factor widely accepted by the international judge and several <coughs> criteria may be written to assess this capacity in concreto, for example, economic, uh, technical knowledge, etc. According to the UN uh, International Condi uh, Commission, the standard of due diligence against which the conduct of a state should be examined is proportional to the degree of the risk. And the International uh, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea found that the standard of due diligence has to be more severe for the riskier activities. However, not all risks of harm are covered by the obligation of diligence. The damage must reach a certain threshold. The Tallinn Manual speaks about serious adverse consequences, while we can find also the term significant used by the UN ILC or in other judgments. Well, I will end my uh, presentation um, with some words on state uh, responsibility. Due diligence could play an important role in order to circumvent the major problem of attribution in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it is indifferent whether the acts in question were committed by a state, a non-state actor, a proxy. The only thing that matters for due diligence is to know whether the elements constituting its violation are present. Did the state know or should it have known that its infrastructure was being used to launch a cyber attack causing serious adverse consequences to another state? Had it failed to take the reasonable measures to prevent the harm? If the answers to these questions are positive, the responsibility for, of the states could be involved whatever the author of the acts. Of course, this does not resolve all the problems, but as summarized in the French strategic review of cyber defense, a state which has not fulfilled this obligation of conduct could thus, in certain cases, incur its responsibility, even if it is not the sponsor. The fear now that state's responsibility could be engaged every time they are not able to prevent the occurrence of an arm to another state due to cyber operations seems, however, highly exaggerated. And it goes against well-established international case law in all fields and uh, in all uh, jurisdictions. In the DRC versus Uganda case, for instance, the ICG clearly said that despite the fact that U DRC had been unable to deter attacks launched by rebels from its territory against Uganda, its responsibility could not be engaged because the DRC has taken all measures at its disposal in order to prevent the situation. Due diligence is an obligation of conduct, not of result. And so, as a result, there are very strong requirements and conditions to engage responsibility for the failure of due diligence obligation. So, as a conclusion, I would like to say first that far from destabilizing international <coughs> law, the obligation of due diligence in cyberspace could could turn out to be salutary in making states more responsible without, however, increasing international, um, um, the international responsibility. Due diligence could also make it possible to resolve the problem of the legal qualification of a cyber attack 
and the existential question of knowing whether or not these cyber attacks constitute an international wrongful act. Instead of putting the emphasis on the legal qualification of a cyber attack, this principle makes it possible to focus on what could, um, on what could have been done by a state and on what the state did not do. Thus, without having to search whether or not the cyber attack in question is the action of a state, and without having to search which exact norm has been violated, one could focus on the fact that the state knew that a cyber attack had been launched, had the means of acting to prevent the cyber attack or to stop it, and however, did nothing toward this. So returning to the starting point of this presentation, qui peut et n'empêche pêche, he who can and does not prevent sins. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much, Karine. And I'm sure you're already starting to think about questions. I see no uh, hands immediately up in the air. So let me kick off by asking each of our speakers one quick question. And then I'll ask you to answer those. And then I'm going to open uh, to uh, everybody in the audience. So maybe I'll do it in the reverse order. Karine, uh, I found it very interesting in your, you know, the star-shaped diagram that you used in the beginning of your presentation, that you accept the, that uh, the principle of due diligence forms a part of the Lex Lata. And now we know the position of the international group of experts on this, but I wonder what your thoughts are on the UNGG being much more lukewarm, much more ambiguous, uh, because even in the 2015 report, all that the group of governmental experts said was that states should engage in, in due diligence, but there is no must engage in due diligence. And also, you refer to the French position, but just last week we have had the UK Attorney General outline the UK position, and due diligence is noticeably absent from his remarks. So I wonder what your thoughts on the Lex Lata aspect are. Now, Peter, I think uh, Karine highlights something very interesting that feeds into your presentation, and that is that the biggest bite of this rule is as it pertains to non-state actors. Now, your argument primarily focuses on state operations. So if a state engages in the cyber impact assessment, this will be the impact that it has. But what happens if we have oper cyber operations by non-state actors that are launched from a territory of a state? Can this cyber impact assessment help against those as well? Because arguably, this is a bigger problem in the area of due diligence. And uh, Mike. Uh, I, I wonder about uh, your, your thoughts about the following scenario. So let's accept that it's, uh, it's uh, Lex Lata. Let's uh, accept that it's uh, about non-state actors. Now, let's suppose that you find out that uh, a cyber operation is uh, underway. And it is underway against another state. Now, under your analysis, under cer certain circumstances, you have to notify the other state, right? So what if i'm sorry cyber operation from where to where so there is, is a cyber operation so there is a cyber operation uh, from the territory of state a that will negatively impact will impact on the rights of another state exactly as under your analysis now at what point does the state need to notify the other state of this operation if that would mean that in doing so it oh. would have to disclose its capabilities because it has to know somehow but there might be a lot of confidentiality and a lot of uneasiness related to disclosing those capabilities. Yep. So that would be my question. But shall we start with Karin? Yes, Kubo, thank you. So concerning the, um, the lax lata and due diligence, I think that, uh, first of all, we, ha we have to see that since the 19th century, there is such a huge practice in this field, application of due diligence in every field of international law. So it became very difficult to say that due diligence is not part of the Lex Lata. And um, of course, uh, the question is why the UNGGE said should and not must. Mm. Uh, this is a good question. And I think that there is some members of the UNGGE here that could be uh, better to answer to this question. But um, they, I, I think that uh, they say should, but they d didn't reject the, uh, the fact that due diligence is part of the Lex Lata. The, mm. It was not written also. And to be sure that a lot of members of the UNGGE 
agreed that uh, due diligence is part of the Lex Lata. So maybe some uh, staff members are obviously against uh, this case, uh, maybe as the UK, but I, I think it's not enough mm -hmm. to reject the, uh, the positivity of due diligence in the cyberspace. Thank you. Peter? So, so the question is, would the cyber impact assessment address non-state actor activity? And I think it would, because the procedural requirement for the cyber impact assessment is on the state to conduct the assessment. And what the assessment will do, it will trigger the knowledge requirement for due diligence. And if the state, through their cyber impact assessment, sees that non-state actors are using the cyber infrastructure, then the due diligence obligation would attach to the state to try to prevent uh, that activity. And so it, it, that's the advantage of the procedural aspect, is that it continuously places the obligation on the state, um, even in the presence of non-state actor activity, which you may not be able to get state responsibility for through an attribution model. Thank you. Mike? Did you want us to comment on the others, or you just want us to ask the question? Can, can you maybe now respond to the okay. question? If we have more time, we can then also respond to the others. So um, actually, your question is an easy one. Your question is operation from state A, uh, clearly not by the state organs, obviously, because this would not implicate due diligence, but rather this would obligate other primary norms. So it's not by the state, and it's negatively impacted in another state. And your question is, when is there a need to notify. It's important to understand that there's never a need to notify the other state that is suffering the harm unless that is the only way you can put it into the operation. So we address this very situation in the manual and we say that the state must do whatever it can to put an end to the operation and need not contact the other state because its obligation is an obligation of conduct to take feasible measures to put an end to it. So the better question is, what happens if necessarily the state, and it, it could be with respect to classific classified information or whatever, what happens if the impact of taking the obligation that you have under due diligence works harm on you, on the state shouldering the due diligence obligation? And uh, Karen addressed this, Karin addressed this very nicely in the left corner of her triangle, mm -hmm. and she said there's a wane of interest. So the due diligence obligation is not at attached if you're going to, for example, suffer great harm yourself. Thank you. I think we can then debate the, the balancing of that, but I see already now a forest of hands. So I have Gary, then Theodore, and then Cedric. Gary. Hi, thanks. Uh, Colonel Gary Korn, US Cyber Command. Um, first for Peter, not Paul, <laughs> nor Mary. Um, Sorry. I just don't do names. Just P. P works. So let Jeff talk. And there's a thread here. Thank you. <laughs> Horrible. Michelle. Um, <laughs> and, and so it starts. And so it starts. Now, there's a, there's a thread here to the following question from Mike um, and or Karine. So you said national cyber infrastructure. I'd be interested in your definition of that. That can be fairly narrow or very broad. Is my home router part of the national cyber infrastructure that would be subject to your you know, cyber impact assessment? Um, and I absolutely confess I'm not an environmental law attorney or expert, but I do think, just as you mentioned, even in imp environmental impact statements within US law, and I think it's probably fairly consistent, there's a balance in those as well. It's not that you know, if you find that you will have some level of harm to the environment, it's an all stop. There's a balance of interests. One of the interests, national security. Another interest is privacy interests that come to play here, which is, I think, the elephant in the due diligence right. room. And so, Mike, um, over to you, you or Karine, the, the question there I have is, I get that domestic law is not a relevant factor in your assessment, that's relatively consistent or fully consistent with other principles of application right. of international law. Um, it does put states in a very difficult position in this area, but also there is an international law, human rights law component to the very kind of issue at stake here, which is the, the sort of privacy question that looms large in this area of cyber monitoring and all these other things which I think ultimately does distinguish this area from environmental law or other areas of law because those don't implicate the same sort of clash of interests that this area would, would involve. So those are the questions. Thank you, Gary. Great question. 
Mike? Oh, Gary, it's a great question, and it's a like point on observation. We were speaking only about domestic law. To the extent that you have uh, a prohibition under international law, and the one you cite is the prohibition most likely to be implicated, a uh, violation of an international human rights obligation to individuals uh, under your effective control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In that case, it would not be feasible as a matter of law for you to engage in that particular um, operation, putting it into that operation. So unlike domestic law, international human rights law is a get out of jail free card. Very good observation. Karine, did you also want to respond? Yes, I wanted to, to come back to the question of monitoring because uh, I think it's a, it's a very important question uh, concerning knowledge and monitoring. And if states have the obligation you know, to, to, to have constructive knowledge, and uh, it is true that the question of human rights is an important one because um, we have to be very aware with the, the application of the due diligence in the cyberspace in order you know, to avoid that uh, the due diligence could be erode civil liberties and uh, humanitarian law uh, because of trying to have knowledge of what's happened on that territory. So from this point, it's very interesting to see also the legal aspects in the states. Yes, to answer your question on what would the cyber infrastructure look like in those cyber impact assessments, it would be whatever infrastructure, objects, persons that are under the sovereign control of the state, either domestically or uh, overseas, outside, extraterritorially. So those would be objects that the state has either uh, enforcement or prescriptive jurisdiction over under international law. And the states define that. It's, this, it's exactly what the International Court of Justice said for the environmental impact assessments, which is the scope and the nature of that assessment is defined by the state and the state's own domestic laws. Okay, so Theodore. Yes, uh, uh, Theodore Christakis, uh, Institut Universitaire de France. Uh, I have a double question for Michael, but uh, everybody could uh, jump in. Is he allowed in. to do that? <laughs> well, I know he you. Me, he asked I me know you. not to ask we'll, a we'll tough question before the, okay. the meeting, but it will be an easy one, and I think okay. he's the only one probably here to be able to respond to, to this question. Um, you, and it's a little bit the follow-up of your question. We know that... Uh, uh, at least among the like-minded group of states in the UNGG and the international level, a lot of states, not only France, but several other states were very, very much in favor of the principle of due diligence mm -hmm. in order to introduce mm -hmm. uh, uh, rules of uh, responsible conduct of states in the cyberspace. Mm -hmm. um, the Nordic states, I think, that a lot of states were uh, in favor uh, of this. There were two states who were reluctant to endorse this principle, the one you mentioned, the UK, and especially the United States. So my question is, Mike, could you please give us an explanation about this reluctance of the United States to the due diligence principle? And the second double question, which is linked to the first one, is the following, uh, and you hinted to this at the end of your speech. Is there uh, not an amazing contradiction in the attitude of the United States on the one hand, they say that there is no, due, no general rule of, uh, no general principle of due diligence. And on the other hand, they try to promote the unable or unwilling theory. Let's forget the unwilling, as you said, and let's focus on the unable. So, and you, and this is something that also concerns the Italian manual, regretfully, the Italian manual, well, not as a rule, but the majority of experts, you say, endorsed the unable or unwilling principle, which is regretful because uh, a few months before the publication of the second edition of the Italian Manual, 250 professors of international law all over the world, including authorities like Georges Abissad, Martin Koskinian, and many others, uh, signed a petition against the abusive invocation of self-defense in uh, cyberspace in order precisely uh, to focus on this issue of the enable or unwilling theory, the risks that it entails, and the fact that it's not part of the Lex Lab. So my question is, can we uh, say, at the one hand, there is no obligation to prevent, no due diligence obligation, and on the other hand, say that we have the right to bomb a state which is unable to prevent? I think that there is something uh, incoherent there. Thank you very much. You know you're giving him an easy way out, because he can just say he's not representing the US here. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if there is somebody who could have knowledge about the answer, I think it's Mike. Mike? <laughs> 
So you know I'm just a simple country lawyer from South Texas. <laughs> I don't make U.S. policy, amigo. <laughs> okay. So I can't answer the first question. I do not want answered in the context of the United States or United Kingdom because we discussed this question ad nauseum. As part of the Tallinn manual process, the government of the Netherlands had three meetings with state representatives, delegations, some of whom were in this room. And we uh, were operating under Chatham House rules. So I can only tell you what the objection was, not which state was involved in the object, which states were involved in the objection, but the objection was a reasonable one. Here's what one delegate said to me. A, a person who I have extraordinary respect for as an international lawyer. Uh, the individual said to me, this due diligence obligation, you don't understand what this means for us. This is an extraordinary obligation to take on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. Because every single day, we're not talking about an obligation of prevention. We're talking about every single day from our territory, thousands and thousands and thousands of operations that are hostile to other states, particularly if you buy into the rule of sovereignty, uh, which this individual did, and which I do too, he said, how in the world do we shoulder that obligation? And that was a fair comment. That's, it's nice for some small state that doesn't have a lot of operations mm -hmm. mounted to say, kumbaya, you guys got to protect me out there. But when you're a big territory and lots of bad stuff is happening on your territory, that's a mighty heavy burden to shoulder. My response was, we need to understand what we're saying, what we, the manual, and this is why we were so very conservative. It affects rights, not interests. Rights, not interest. You got to cite a legal right. It has serious adverse consequences. You have to demonstrate knowledge, on and on and on. It has to be feasible. Feasible takes into account your capabilities. And as my friend Gary said, feasibility takes into account your other international legal obligations. So we, we said to these individuals, I, I'm a believer in due diligence, obviously, we, we said, you need to understand we're not asking for much. We're just, we are, we'll be conservative and this doesn't put much on your shoulders. I do know in a number of states that this is an ongoing uh, discussion. I'm not a party to the discussion. I happen to believe that what we set forth and not, by the way, the preventive principle is a fair reflection of the law. And as I travel around, I see a lot of states that are very supportive of this, but we have to watch. You're a law professor, I'm a law professor. Guess what? We don't make law. States make law. With regard to the unwilling and able test, boy, you really poked me in the eye there. Um, so I'm a big advocate of, I've written for years, years uh, in support of the unwilling and able uh, test in international law, and this is the way it works for me. In the unwilling and able test, we have clashing rights in international law. You have the right of sovereignty, which protects the, the state into which the operation is being conducted. You also have the right of self-defense. These two rights are among the most important rights that we find in international law. And in these cases, clearly they come into conflict. So there are those scholars, and, they, uh, and I'm not among them, who say it's a binary choice. They win, sovereignty wins, or self-defense wins. I don't agree with that. I believe that when you have conflicting rights in international law, it fosters international peace and security to find a reasonable accommodation of these rights, the most reasonable. So you know my writings on this subject. I, although I say there is an unwilling and able test, I go on and on and on about the limitations placed thereon. For example, in and out as quickly as possible, avoid collateral damage, blah, blah. Now, we're here to talk about due diligence. In the due diligence situation, we adopted only the unable, I'm sorry, unwilling that open, that, that causes a breach. Because here we don't have this clash of the giants of, of international law principles. We have a state that's suffering less, usually, usually less harmful operations, and we're not really, in a way, we're affecting the sovereignty of the state with due diligence but not in the way that you are when you conduct a drone operation and kill someone in their country. So we said in this particular case, we did not feel that the logic that applied in, with respect to the majority in our group, vis-a-vis self-defense, the logic applied has cleanly here. And because we were taking a conservative approach, 
We, because of the pushback of states, we listened to states. Because we were taking a conservative approach, we decided to stick with the uh, only when a state is unwilling. And we would not impose, we would not say you're breaching uh, an international law obligation when you don't have the ability to comply with it. Make sense? Glad I've convinced you. Thank you, Mike. Next on... You, and we can continue the, the discussion afterwards, definitely. Uh, we have a few minutes left and two questions still in the queue. So it's Cedric and then Leo, and I think I'm afraid that will be the end of our time. Cedric. Okay, thanks. One question for Mike and one for Peter. Where's the question coming from? Here. Ah, okay. Hey, hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, so one, we, we've had this discussion before, and it's still not clear to me exactly where you stand on this. You've said at the beginning that due diligence gives something to states, which is the ability to take countermeasures if the other state uh, from which a non-state actor is right. operating right. Uh, does not take uh, feasible measures. Now, this is helpful when the state is uh, unwilling. But if the state is willing and unable, what then would be, under your construction, the available tools for the victim state? That's one question. And the question for Peter, it's um, something about your proposal, it's not clear to me. Um, as Mike initially pointed out, when we talk about preventive uh, uh, due diligence uh, and the, all the scenarios that he's given, uh, it's scenarios where there's a non-state actor using the servers of some country to conduct an attack. And in the two ICJ, the most recent ICJ cases in the, in the field of uh, environmental law, in both cases, as far as I remember, it was cases where the country on its own is building something uh, and it's uh, uh, starting something that it knows or should know, you could say, will cause uh, uh, transboundary harm. So how does that fit exactly with the scenarios that Mike uh, was giving? And, I admit these are the scenarios that I have in mind when, when I think about due diligence, where it's not the state that on its own is doing something, because that would be a cyber operation, but rather that against its will, its servers are being used. So how, how would you apply the, the impact assessment to those cases? And so the, the red clock of death is telling us that we have one minute left. So we, with apologies to Leo, I think we will have to park that question until the coffee break. And with an eye on uh, the organizers, Tomas, can we eat five minutes into the coffee break? Yeah, so I'm going to give you each about two minutes to respond, if, if you could do that. Mike, do you want to so, start? Yeah, so I'm not convinced that you don't understand my answer. I'm pretty convinced you don't like my answer, <laughs> uh, because we've had this discussion before. Listen, we took the view that countermeasures are unavail unavailable against non-state actors. So let's look at a situation where there's no breach of due diligence. Non-state actors are in another state's territory acting. What can you do? Step one, retorsion against that state to cause that state to round them up cooperative law enforcement, uh, sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's obvious. Now you have a bit of a gap. The next step here is the plea of necessity. The plea of necessity under Article 25 of the Articles of State Responsibility say that if your essential interests are being affected in a grave and imminent way, then you may take actions into the other territory, even though the other territory has nothing to do with it and is not in breach of any obligation owed you. The problem here, my friend, is that we have to get pretty high, essential interest, and I think you understand that. And of course, if you have an armed attack, you know my view very well. My view is that non-state actors can commit armed attacks. There is an out for states. We weren't preaching to states. We were committed to providing all of the options for states. That was our, that was our charter. And so when we went to The Hague, Elise uh, Vihul and I were at The Hague uh, talking to states in the sessions, a view was expressed that says you may take countermeasures against actions by non-state actors. In fact, the, some of the same advocates also said that non-state actors can violate sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So as you look at the manual, it's for states to decide what's the right view. We put that view in there. Although none of the experts agreed with this, we acknowledge the existence of such a view. And so when I look out at the ambassador and other representatives of states, I'm not telling you what, what to choose. All I wanted to do was lay out the options. So if your state uh, is concerned about that option, I would recommend that you adopt the view that you may take countermeasures against non-state actors, and then your problem's solved. Two Every problem is solved in the little green book, okay? <laughs> Two minutes exactly, well done, Mike. Peter. So you're correct that 
impact assessments in environmental law are limited to the state's activities. Um, I'm proposing a broader approach because of the nature of cyber attacks and cyber issues in that the state has to conduct an annual cyber assessment that would include a review of third-party non-state actor activity if it becomes known to the state through that assessment. So this is a broader assessment than what would be required under international environmental law, and only when the state gains knowledge through that assessment of a particular type of potential use of the cyber infrastructure and what the threshold for harm would be, what the threshold for response would be is a separate question. This is just, mm -hmm. at the outset, the baseline procedural obligation is to conduct the assessment. And from there, they can derive the knowledge. And I would just say a general comment on, is due diligence reflective of customary international law? I think due diligence is reflective of customary international law, period. And that international law principles apply in cyberspace until states uh, agree otherwise and develop a lex specialis that basically withdraws themselves from that general principle. And so if you're not a persistent objector to the due diligence principle, and you don't develop with other states a lex specialis that carves yourself out of the due diligence principle, I think it applies to you in cyberspace. I don't speak on behalf of any government, but that's my, mm. that's my position. Thank you, Peter. And so as you can see, we haven't exhausted our speakers. We haven't exhausted the questions. We haven't exhausted the topic, but we have exhausted our time. And so it would be a violation of due diligence on my part, and I would suffer serious adverse consequences from the organizers if I didn't draw a line here. So please welcome me and join me in uh, congratulating our speakers. Thank you.